Frank, and thank you for inviting me here um, to testify. In Our Own Backyard is a very fitting title um, for this hearing, and I think the, the predominant response over the last few years has been not in my backyard to this issue. We've had a tough time um, getting people to recognize that this is really happening, and you quoted some stats earlier, 100,000 youth, 300,000 youth potentially at risk for sexual exploitation in this country. So we know and we're faced with the reality at this point that this isn't something that's only happening in other countries to other people's children, but it's happening here. While the Trafficking Victims Protection Act was passed in 2000 and reauthorized three times since, it's only really recently that there's been a concerted effort to view and treat American girls as trafficking victims. As as a nation, we've graded and rated other countries on how they address trafficking within their borders and yet have effectively ignored the sale of our own children within our own borders. We've created a dichotomy of acceptable and unacceptable victims, wherein Katia from the Ukraine will be seen as a real victim and provided with services and support, but Keisha from the Bronx will be seen as a willing participant, someone who's out there because she likes it and who is criminalized and thrown in detention or jail. We've turned a blind eye to the millions of adult men in this country who create the demand because they believe they have the right to purchase another human being. We've allowed popular culture to glorify and glamorize the commercial sex industry and particularly pimp culture. Our policies and economic choices have left huge numbers of children at risk for many things, including commercial sexual exploitation, simply because of the zip code they live in. And we've allowed the juvenile justice and criminal justice systems to treat victims of heinous violence and abuse as criminals while the adult men who've bought and sold them go free. We've sent 12, 13, 14 year old girls to juvenile detention facilities and ignored the fact that these children aren't off often even old enough to legally consent to sex and are in fact statutory rape victims. Today's hearing signifies how far we've come in beginning to address this issue and that there is real change afoot. The attention of the federal government is critical in addressing this issue and the presence of representatives from law enforcement, the Department of Justice and the State Department's Trafficking Persons Office demonstrates significant progress in the recognition of what's happening to children in our own backyard. Slowly, we're beginning to use the appropriate language, recognizing that calling children who are victims of rape, sexual assault, and violence prostitutes is neither helpful nor accurate. Using the terminology child prostitution or child prostitute conjures up stereotypes and misconceptions about who these children are and how we should treat them. One of the most important things for the domestic violence movement was naming what was happening and giving it an accurate name. It was violence and it was happening in a domestic situation. It's critical that we accurately label this crime against children as commercial sexual exploitation and domestic trafficking. In doing so, we can begin to make the shift from treating these youth as criminals and instead treating them as victims which they rightfully deserve. As you mentioned, in 2008, New York State became the first state in the nation to pass legislation that addressed the criminalization of children who are sexually exploited and trafficked. I'd be remiss if I didn't note that this victory was due in large part to the efforts, courage, and voices of the girls and young women at GEMS who journeyed up to Albany year after year, who testified before city state and city legislators who spoke to the press, who participated in awareness raising events, sharing their stories with the hope of changing the system for their peers. New York's Safe Harbor for Exploited Youth Act converts charges of prostitution for children under 16 to a person in need of supervision case, thereby shifting the focus from a juvenile justice issue into a child welfare issue. The Safe Harbor Act also mandates the creation of a safe house for victims and training for law enforcement and service providers who come into contact with trafficked and exploited children. While the law does not go into effect until April 1st, 2010 this year, the shift in New York's uh, systemic and institutional response is already happening. Across the country, several states are trying to follow suit and pass their own v version of the Safe Harbor Act. It's my hope in the 10 years we will look back and think it was ludicrous that we ever prosecuted children for an act of prostitution. Yet despite gains made in awareness and advocacy in law enforcement prosecuting cases of traffickers, service providers recognizing a need for treatment, we still have a really long way to go. Children across the country are still being treated as criminals. In the last few months alone, GEMS has been contacted by organizations and individuals uh, for technical assistance and training in cities and states across the nation, including San Diego, T Tennessee, Hawaii, Miami, Tampa, Indiana, Oakland, Portland, Ohio, Connecticut, Philadelphia, 
All of these places are witnessing the sale of children in their own communities, and yet few have any resources to address this issue. Currently, there are less than 50 beds in the entire country for victims of sexual exploitation and trafficking, and approximately a dozen specialized service providers. Many states don't have any specialized services at all, and those of us who are directly serving victims do so with a scarcity of resources and support. Monies allocated in the TVPRA for services for domestic victims have yet to be appropriated. We recognize at this point that incarcerating children for their victimization is not only unjust, it just doesn't work. Services work, support works, love works. When girls are afforded the opportunity to be safe and valued and cared for, they're able to thrive and flourish. Victims of commercial and sexual exploitation have myriad needs and require comprehensive services. They need to be in an environment where they're supported, not judged, cared for, not shamed. They need a variety of shelter and housing options, including crisis shelter, therapeutic foster homes, residential treatment, and long-term independent and transitional living programs. They need individual group and family counseling and mental health treatment to address the intense trauma that they've experienced in the commercial sex industry and frequently prior to their recruitment. They need medical treatment that's sensitive and comprehensive, addressing not only their sexual health, but their physical trauma from repeated violence, their overall wellness, including lack of proper nutrition, pregnancy, parenting issues. They need education, both formal and informal, to help them return to school and to learn critical life skills which they've been deprived of during their exploitation. They need job readiness skills, employment training, viable opportuni employment opportunities to help them achieve economic independence. They need the opportunity to develop their skills and talents to have fun as young people, to create healthy relationships with their peers, and be supported in a strength-based environment. They also critically need to see other girls, young women, and adult women who've experienced and overcome the same challenges so that they can be empowered to make the transition from victim to survivor, from survivor to leader. All of these services require resources which are currently limited. Commercially sexually exploited and trafficked youth have not been high on anyone's agenda and priority list. While commercial sexual exploitation can and does happen to any child, this issue dis disproportionately affects low-income children, children of color, children who've been in the child welfare system, children who've been in the juvenile justice system, children who don't have a voice in public policy, children who are frequently ignored. Traffickers and exploiters know exactly who to target, who'll be featured on the news, who'll be seen as a real victim. Issues of race and class, prior victimization, have ensured that our ch these children are frequently invisible in our national dialogue. Yet it's incumbent upon us to make sure that all victims, all children and youth, are treated with equity, compassion, and afforded the resources that they need to deserve and heal. As a survivor-led organization, GEMS believes that survivors need to be at the forefront of this movement and has been committed for over a decade in ensuring that the voices and experiences of survivors are integral in the development and implementation of programs and policies designed to serve them. Today, you have an opportunity to hear from Shaquana, a young woman, college student, outreach worker, activist, and leader who I'm incredibly proud and honored to get to work with every single day. Uh, while Shaquana is an extraordinary young woman, she's not unique in her experiences, nor in her intelligence, resilience, and courage. Every single day at GEMS, we serve extraordinary girls and young women who are growing, learning, and most importantly, healing in a community of love and support that we've created, and who are in turn supporting and empowering their peers, advocating for change, raising public awareness, and demonstrating leadership on this issue. If teenage girls and young women who've experienced heinous violence and exploitation are able to take action and be change agents in fighting against commercial sexual exploitation and domestic trafficking, it begs the question, what are our local, state, and federal legislators and representatives doing? I challenge you today to join our young women in ending the sale and exploitation of children in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lloyd. You've given a bit of an introduction to our next witness here, but I want to say a few extra words. Uh, Shaquana works with Rachel Lloyd at GEMS and is herself a child sex trafficking survivor. For privacy purposes, we are not using her last name. She escaped sexual exploitation and then has an amazing story to tell. She graduated valedictorian of her class at Brownsville Academy High School in Brooklyn, New York in 2008. She is attending college at the borough of Manhattan Community College. She has made presentations before the New York State Legislature and the Toronto International Film Festival. Shaquana, thank you for being here today and having the courage to share your story with us. And the floor is yours. Make sure you push the button. 
It says talk, so we can all hear you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Shaquana, and I'm a survivor of commercial sexual exploitation and domestic trafficking. I was getting ready to graduate from the eighth grade when I met a man in my neighborhood. I shared everything about myself with him. He seemed like a complete gentleman. Yet soon at only 14 years old, I was being manipulated and physically abused to sell my body for this man who was a pimp. I didn't have anyone in my life that I could have been completely honest with about what I was doing without them judging me. I was afraid and often felt like everything I was experiencing was all my fault. I was living in this big world, but I felt so small and alone. I cried myself to sleep many nights because I was very unhappy with my life, but had no idea how to escape. At only 14, I got arrested and sent to a juvenile detention facility. Jail just made me feel even worse. I was made to feel embarrassed and ashamed for everything that I had experienced. I never received counseling and was left to figure things out on my own. It was there, though, that I learned of GEMS through the outreach team, which was for girls that had been through the same things I had been through. When I finally got out of jail after several months, I was mandated to GEMS. It seemed like all my family and even the judge thought jail was what I needed, as if I were the criminal. My own family thought that I would never amount to anything, and it was almost like they stopped caring about me. I started going to gyms and created a new family for myself. It was like for the first time in my life, people understood me and didn't think that I was crazy. It took me a while to fully leave the life behind me, but there was that constant hope for me at times when I didn't have it for myself from gyms. I didn't get out of the life until I was 16 years old. I still can't remember what actually happened, but I was beaten and nearly killed by a man who had bought me. I woke up in the hospital in New Jersey with my entire face broken and fractured and needed months of re reconstructive surgery. At that point, I just felt really lucky to be alive. I started participating in gyms again, which helped me to deal with the trauma that had happened to me. I attended all the groups and especially youth leadership where I learned about what it meant to be commercially sexually exploited. It was through gyms that I learned that even though so much had happened to me as a young girl, it didn't mean I would have to spend the rest of my life crying. I could be a survivor, which meant going back to school, graduating, having real friends and first dates. When I went back to school, I struggled a lot, but because I had the support of gyms, that helped me to begin believing in myself too. In 2008, I graduated from high school as a valedictorian. That was one of the most happiest days of my life because it was a testimony to how much I'd overcome. Now I'm in college, now I'm in college. Being in school means a lot to me because at one time I didn't think I would ever make it. At gyms I know, at gyms I now help run our educational initiative program. As we all know, education is very important and a lot of our girls after getting into the life are forced to have to stop going to school. Our educational initiative was designed to help our girls go back to school and assist them with whatever they need help with. Having this program at gyms is very important because at one time I felt like I would never be able to do anything productive with my life, but I know that I can. It's important that our members see me as an example and know that if I can do it, they can too. Today I also work at gyms as an outreach worker. I travel to juvenile detention facilities, group homes and schools to educate girls on the issue of commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking. This is very important to me because a lot of the times the girls have no idea what really goes on and if I can reach them before an exploiter ever does, they will know the truth of what the life really offers. I let them know that if they have been a victim of trafficking, there is a place where they can get help and won't be judged. As I travel to juvenile detention facilities, I see the same victimization by the staff is still happening to the girls, and it's important that I am there to let them know that what happened to them isn't their fault. I was a part of helping get the Safe Arbor Hack passed so that girls will no longer be sent to jail for having been commercially sexually exploited. Girls will now be recognized as victims and will receive services. Most importantly, though, I think the Safe Harbor Act will help people see who the real perpetrators are. I would like to thank you for listening to my testimony of what I have been through as a survivor of commercial sexual exploitation and hope that you were able to see how young women that have been commercially sexually exploited need support, not jail. And, and that will help them begin rebuilding the type of lives that we all deserve. Thank you. Shaquana, thank you. I mean it from my heart that you would come here today and tell this story because it really puts a face on the issue. Uh, and as you're serving as an outreach worker, uh, and 
you're in contact with young girls who are in the life, as you call it, what are they looking for to leave? What does it take to get them to leave that life? Um, I think what they have to begin to understand, you know, is they start to see that there is a safe place and it's something totally different that they probably never had in their life and it takes them time and they need people that are going to be patient with them and understand them and see the things that they've went through and help them to understand that they're not a bad person, that it's not their fault, and to begin offering them the, you know, that you can go back to school and that you can start your life entirely over and that what happened to you in the past doesn't mean that this has to be how the rest of your life is going to be. So are they afraid of the pimps if they leave, that the pimps will come after them? Um, a lot of times girls are scared that even if they testify against them that they might get hurt for doing that. Um, a lot of times the girls, you know, they're just scared or they love them and they don't want to do it. You know, at that time they're not ready for that. And what do you do? What do you offer to them? What do you say to them to try to convince them that it's worth the risk? Um, I think they begin, they have to understand what happened to them is wrong and that it wasn't their fault. A lot of times girls feel like it was their choice and you have to show them that, you know, that you were manipulated, you know, that this person doesn't care about you and that this is what they're using you for. So you were put in jail and you say in your testimony that you were mandated to the GEMS program, which mm -hmm. I assume means that when you left jail, you had to go to this gym's program. So yes. The jail experience was awful, just mm -hmm. terrible as you described it, but it did result in your connecting up with this gym's program. I mean, not a, what actually happened was through the outreach program coming there, they were able to, that's how I met up with them. I was able to find a case manager. They set me up with that and, you know, they told me that I could go home to this program or if I would have never found out about gyms, then I was going to go upstate. So it was through like my own luckiness, I guess. So Miss Lloyd, your GEMS program, um, how many young people like uh, Shaquana are part of it uh, each year? I mean, have you been in existence for a few years now? We've been serving girls and young women for over Actually. 12. Oh. We've been serving girls and young women for over 12 years now. Um, last year we served 275, 280 um, girls and young women who are all victims of commercial sexual exploitation. So as I was trying to get Shaquana to give us a little bit of an idea, a picture of the kind of mindset that the victim brings mm -hmm. uh, to a place like Jim's. And I know the self-esteem is a big issue here. Uh, obviously it is. But in terms, you went through a long litany and list of things mm -hmm. that these young people need. Um, and what would you say is the one thing that uh, really does make a difference in terms of their deciding to turn their lives around and turn into a success like Shaquana? Honestly, I think it comes down, and this is a hard thing to like legislate, but I think it comes down to real, genuine relationships and support. So um, I care? think we have a phenomenal staff. I think the fact that we are a survivor-led organization, we have young women who are survivors who are part of the organization, we have women who aren't survivors who are part of the organization, who are incredible allies. Um, those relationships, I think, begin to, you have to help somebody replace what they've experienced. You can't just take away this sense of kind of support, love, dependence upon the, the trafficker or the pimp without helping replace it with something. And so you need the wraparound services, but you need to have real relationships um, in that service too.